Okay, it's six o'clock. So I think we're going to begin as people start to join. Um, welcome everyone to tonight's Building Bridges, where we're going to focus on women and cardiovascular disease and hopefully answer all your burning questions about what every woman should know uh, about their heart health. And I'm really excited to be joined by three fabulous female cardiologists that are part of our Northwell Health Program. Um, so I'm going to introduce you all and then We'll start off with a bunch of questions um, from there. So I'd like to introduce first, Dr. Evelina Graver. Evelina, say hi. Hi, <laughs> hello everybody. Dr. Graver <laughs> is the director of our Women's Heart Program at the Katz Women's Institute, uh, North Shore University Hospital, LIJ Medical Center. We are also joined by Dr. Dina Katz, who is a senior cardiology attending Phelps Memorial Hospital and clinical cardiologist at Northwell Briarcliff. Hi, Dina. Hello, great to be here. And last but not least, Dr. Samantha Lee, who joins us. She's our Director of Cardiac Telemetry and the Associate Program Director at Staten Island University Hospital. So welcome everybody, um, guests as well. And we're gonna start off tonight um, with just a little note that if you do have any questions uh, during our conversation, uh, because this is a webinar, the best way is to just put them in the chat box. And then towards the end of tonight's conversation, we will hopefully try to get to some of your questions as well. So I want to kick it off um, by asking just a series of general questions to all of you. So feel free to chime in and then we'll do more focused questions um, directed to each of you. But I want to start off by asking, what do you think women need to know about their heart health? that they just don't know. I don't know who I, wants to tackle that one first, maybe Dr. Oh, Graver. <laughs> oh, sure, 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 I'll grab it. I think the first thing that, that they need to know is the fact that they're at risk for it. I think the fact that the first thing that they that women need to be aware of is just pure knowledge of the fact that cardiac disease is not a man's disease. I think that they need to know the fact that uh, their cardiovascular disease may be pre pre presenting totally different than a man's cardiovascular disease. And it could be associated not just, and maybe this is sort of a way into sort of my world of cardiopsetrics, but it could be uh, associated with not even having the traditional risk factors that we've all been taught uh, about through med school, whereas it's just the diabetes, the hypertension, the hyperlipidemia, the high cholesterol um, that potentially leads to cardiac disease, that there's other components to it that are could be related specifically to women, specifically to pregnancies um, that could actually increase their risk for cardiovascular disease. All right, I think that's a great point. I mean, simply just the awareness about a woman's risk. Um, Dr. Katz, what do you think uh, women need to know that they don't know? Well, I think what women need to know about their heart is actually similar what, to what men need to know about their heart, and we all do, is that we know our bodies better than anyone. No matter what a doctor says or anything you read, we have lived in our own bodies for how many years? I don't want to say, but um, we know our own bodies. So if a woman is having a symptom or a problem or something that feels unusual, you have to be your own health advocate and really go to the doctor and be persistent and maybe see different providers. But you have to get all your questions and concerns addressed because that's what this webinar is all about, is to raise awareness that women develop heart disease, even young women. So if you think something's something is wrong, you have to address it. Such a great point and so, so important. Um, I talk about that a lot with, with patients and even friends who have visited a provider and just feel like they didn't have a great interaction or they weren't heard. And I think a lot of people don't think that they can get a second opinion or see someone else um, and they don't trust their intuition. So that's a really, really important point. Uh, Dr. Lee, what about you? What's at the top of your list for telling women? I think Dr. Graver and Dr. Katz made great points. So I will pivot and make other points. Um, I think one thing that often happens in women patients is I often see them taking care of a lot of their family members, um, their loved ones, and not spending time on themselves. So I think something that's important to think of as a woman is making sure you're taking the time out to care for yourself. Because if you're not healthy, if you're not taking care of your body, you can't help others. Um, and the other thing is kind of the point that Dr. Graver was making, or one of the many points, is how women can present differently. Uh, so one of the stories I often like to tell women is, I remember this patient I had when I was in residency and she kept on having 
what she thought was like constipation or upset stomach and going to the bathroom and she was actually having a heart attack. And so she got incredibly sick and we took care of her and we had her in the cardiac care unit and we got her back to the floor. And then she, again, felt a little nauseous, felt a little uncomfortable, went to the bathroom and, you know, passes out in the bathroom. And so she kept on thinking that this symptom of kind of like an upset stomach was just an upset stomach, but it was out of what's normal for her. And for her, that was her symptom of a heart attack. And so I think it is really notable that women can present as just a feeling of unwellness, maybe nausea, maybe an upset stomach or a reflux that doesn't go away with Pepsid um, and keep that in mind and kind of all in the same vein that women present differently and that you know your body's best. So if it's out of the ordinary for you, it's something to be concerned about. That was actually my next question um, was, was exactly that, which is how do women or can women present differently from men? So I think um, that I'm glad you brought that up. And I think one of the other things that women don't often think about is that so often cardiovascular disease is, is quiet, right? It's silent until the day that we discover it. And I think that can be eye-opening for a lot of people. In fact, I just had a patient who was the picture of health in her 50s, and she was shocked to learn that she had a calcium score of over 200, that she had coronary artery disease. And, and really, it was kind of a life-changing diagnosis for her. So um, uh, how, do we, how do we get that message across, you know, that sometimes there are no symptoms? Um, and, and how do we kind of use that to help uh, get people on the right road to prevention? I actually... <laughs> Okay, so uh, you know, I think that um, uh, women and men often present similarly, and probably more often similarly than differently. And but we always have to be on the lookout for how you know the differences in presentation, and also, of course, no symptoms. But let's just clarify what are heart symptoms at all in anyone. I mean, the most characteristic and usual symptoms of a heart attack or angina, the step before a heart attack, is going to be chest discomfort. And, and the majority of women do actually feel chest discomfort. Um, and that chest discomfort is most often described as pressure or tightness or heaviness. We've all heard this. And you know the classic thing is there's something sitting or pressing on my chest. Um, what I find in women sometimes is sort of an unusual symptom. I don't know if all of you have heard this too, but um, oftentimes my patients tell me their bra feels like it's on too tight and they're going for bra fittings to see if they need the next size. And that actually has been, I found to be a symptom of heart disease as well. And then we always, as you know, the other docs have mentioned, the um, symptoms that women can feel can be different as well, like nausea, vomiting, the constipation that Dr. Lee mentioned. But sometimes it's just fatigue, you know, and it's so hard for a woman to know why they're tired. You know, the first thing you think about is not I'm tired because I have a heart artery blockage. Rather, I'm tired because I'm working and taking care of my children and my husband and my home and multitasking. But but sometimes it's a, the symptom of heart disease can just be fatigue or it could be exercise intolerance. You know, you're going to your Zumba class and, and suddenly you're tired. You can't really finish it. You don't feel great. Um, so there could be a lot of things. It could be shoulder pain and back pain and jaw pain and oftentimes uh, flu-like sy symptoms. And then as Dr. Narula points out, women often have no symptoms um, at a higher, a higher instance than men. We have no symptoms. And so, you know, how do you, how do you look at that? Well, we have to practice prevention. We have to have frequent doctor visits and to go over our risk factors and try to see if we're at risk for heart disease. So I would actually echo uh, Dr. Katz in reference to what you're saying. So it's in addition to those frequent office visits, also realize the fact that if there is something, a woman has to be her own advocate so that if the answer, she might not, she's not getting the, that answer from the doctor. If there's you know, I always tell my patients the fact that getting a plain um, EKG is just not sufficient enough because it doesn't give us any sort of prognostic features. It doesn't tell us as to what actually happens to your heart upon exertion. And that if 
you're not getting the answer from your primary care physician, from your family doctor, or even from your cardiologist, that you, you, you know your body well enough to know that something isn't right. And your physician is telling you, well, your EKG looks great and you're young and you're healthy and this is just all in your head and maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's this, right? I think that this is where it's, it's crucial for that woman to say, you know what? maybe it's time for me to get another opinion. Because I had a, a patient uh, not that long ago who literally was a picture perfect of health. She was five foot four at 120 pounds. She, was, she practiced yoga, so she took care of her mental health. She was a runner, so she took care of the cardiovascular component. And, and, but she clearly described symptoms of unstable angina. She would tell me the fact that I would start my run and 10 to 15 minutes into my run, I would have some uncomfortable feeling to the point where my sports bra felt tighter than usual. I would have to sit down, I would rest, but you know what, Dr. Graver, after a couple of minutes, I was good enough to start my run again. And the physicians that she saw before told her the fact that, you know, you're picture perfect, you don't need any kind of cardiac workup, right? This is really just in your head. You have a lot on your plate. You know, she was a dentist. She's like, you run a very busy practice. You have two kids. You have two dogs. You're spread too thin and everything else. And lo and behold, when she actually came to me and we did a little bit more workup, she ended up having triple vessel disease, severe triple vessel disease, disease in all three of her arteries to the point that it was so calcified, heavily calcified, that they couldn't even do a bypass on her because they didn't have enough target zones to actually land. So she now has pretty much stents all through three of her coronary arteries. And this is somebody who literally, if you look at her, you would never even think that way. So I think one of the best advices that I give to my patients and to my female friends and to my family members, is that if you know your body well enough and you know that something isn't right and you're not getting the answer that you think that you may get and you're kind of getting a little bit blown off by a physician, there's plenty of physicians out there that you can actually find that may actually you might have a different relationship with. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I think that um, it kind of epitomizes what so many of us who practice see and mm -hmm. hear from our patients sadly, way too often. I think we hear those stories about women saying that they were told they were anxious, they were stressed out, um, and it's not their heart. And, and, and in fact, many, many times it is. So um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about risk factors. We, we sort of touched on it, but what are you know risk factors for women in general? What are specific risk factors for women? And how do we calculate a woman's risk? Because we talk about that a lot, right? If someone comes into our office, how do we tell them what their risk is? Well, I can grab the traditional risk factors to start. You know, traditional risk factors are things like high blood pressure, having high blood pressure. And, you know, there's a whole campaign, know your numbers. And that includes know, your, know what your blood pressure is. Um, high cholesterol, not only high cholesterol, but the various cholesterol components. And then there are other types of cholesterol, like li right now, like li lipoprotein little a is one of the things we're focusing, focusing in on. So know those numbers too. know what your uh, total cholesterol is and your HDL, the good cholesterol and the LDL bad cholesterol and your triglycerides. These are things that you have to have in your knowledge of arm armamentarium so that you can present that to your physician or they can do it there. Um, things like obesity, and that's, of course, tied into the other risk factors, inactivity. Um, what else do we have? Family history, that's an important one. I mean, that's unfortunately not really modifiable, although we sometimes can change gene expression. But, you know, uh, I know years ago, our parents didn't necessarily tell us about their diseases. It's not like today. And I, I have a lot of patients who say, I don't know what my mom and dad and my grandparents had. They didn't tell us. So it's important to ask about family history. History. Ask your parents, your siblings, um, you know, is there a family history of premature heart disease, which would be having heart disease in a woman at an age less than 65 or a man at an age less than 55? And then, of course, a big risk factor is diabetes, um, which is somewhat preventable and, again, tied into all the other risk factors. And I think the most modifiable is cigarette smoking. 
you know, there's absolutely no reason in 2023 for anyone to smoke cigarettes. It's a huge modifiable risk factor. Those are the traditionals. Thank you. Um, maybe Dr. Lee, do you want to talk a little bit about how we calculate risk? And then Dr. Graver, if you want to talk about the non-traditional risk factors. Sure. Um, so we actually have calculators that are based on prior studies of large population where we put in those variables. So just like um, Dr. Katz was saying, it puts your age, your blood pressure, whether or not you have diabetes, um, family history and smoking, and it tells us kind of what bracket you're in. And then depending on that and your age, we will decide should we do further testing? And we kind of have a lot of options, which I'm sure we'll be talking about later, so I don't wanna to touch on it now, but we have a breadth of options for testing, which are some invasive, where we're actually going inside your body, but many non-invasive. And that can help us get a better idea of whether or not you have heart disease. Um, or we can just decide, maybe we'll start treatment. We'll start you on statins, medications to lower your cholesterol, aspirin to help protect your, you from heart disease. Um, but basically we, put you in kind of these buckets and then we talk to you about what you prefer, how you wanna be treated. Do you wanna focus on risk factor modification, exercising more, quitting smoking, bringing down your blood pressure by lowering the amount of salt in your diet? Do you wanna focus on cutting down on your sugar intake so you get better control of your diabetes? And all of that you can do without medications. And then we can talk about, do you wanna incorporate medications and do you wanna do further testing? So there's kind of a large breadth of ways that we can take what your risk factors are, what your percentage risk is of having heart disease, and how we want to treat it. What about calcium score? A lot of people either haven't heard of it or they wonder what it is. Does it have to do with how much calcium they eat? So can you explain what a calcium score is and how often you use it or why you would use it? So a calcium score is one of those non-invasive tests, meaning we're not going inside your body. It's not a procedure. There's no surgeries. And basically it's a very quick scan and we look at the amount of calcium around your heart. So just to backtrack, because I think as doctors, we tend to use a lot of big words and heart disease is a very blanket term that can mean and encompass a lot of things. We're specifically talking about coronary artery disease, which is a fancy term for just blockages in the arteries around your heart. And your heart is a muscle and just like every other muscle, it needs oxygen and nutrients to work. And so if you have blockages, your heart's not gonna get all the oxygen and nutrients it needs. And that's when you get the symptoms we're talking about, that kind of crushing chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue. And the plaques, the blockages inside your arteries can be made of a lot of things. It's a buildup of kind of fats and cholesterol and calcium. And calcium is just one of the components. And so when you do a calcium scan, what we're doing is we're kind of looking at and tallying up how much calcium you have in those arteries. And if you have zero calcium, that's great. Um, it means that probably you don't have plaque buildup and based on your risk, based on your risk factors, you're probably safe from anywhere from three to seven years. Um, depending on if you're very high risk, we say maybe around three years, if you're very low risk, you know that zero score might last you seven years. Um, if you fall into other ranges, depending on your age, it helps us determine if you should take a statin, if you should take aspirin, or if you have a really high score, like Dr. Narula, you were saying your patient has a calcium score of 400, then we might actually pursue more testing and really see and try to quantify how much that blockage is and do you need a stent, do you need a bypass? Um, the one thing I would say is a calcium score of zero is great in most cases, but there are certain populations in which it's not gonna be accurate. So as I said, plaques are made up of lots of things. Um, calcium is just one component, but you can have, cal uh, sorry, you can have plaques that are mostly just kind of soft cholesterol and buildup and it won't have calcium in it. And so if you're someone who has a soft plaque, your calcium score can be fine, but it doesn't mean that you're safe from a heart attack. And so that's why it's not just about the testing, but it's rather about kind of the whole picture of who you are as a person, who you are as an individual, what your symptoms are and what your risk factors are. Thank you so much. That was such a great and comprehensive explanation of calcium score and risk stratification. So thank you. Um, Evelina, can you talk a little bit about the women's specific uh, risk factors that I think many women have no idea about um, because we never talk about them as much as we should. Um, so go ahead, let us know about those. 
Absolutely. So I, I think obviously, so what you're referring to, Tara, is obviously what's called the adverse pregnancy outcomes. And so um, as recent as several years ago, they've finally been now coined as what's called the novel, novel gender specific risk factors. Uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, they kind of put together these three risk factors, um, one of them being sort of hypertensive disorders that take place during the time of the pregnancy, and that encompasses gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, uh, preterm birth, or fetal growth restriction. So those three uh, risk factors are now known as adverse pregnancy outcomes. And we know the fact that, you know, based upon... Um, you know, preeclampsia, plus or minus preterm birth, plus or minus intrauterine gross restriction, there's a certain risk stratification in reference to how much does that risk of cardiovascular disease does increase lifelong. And in the past, you know, pregnancy was thought of more like Vegas. You know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So they thought that, you know, what happens during the pregnancy stays during the time of the pregnancy. And once the baby is delivered, there's no more risk to the mother or to the baby or anything of that nature. We now know, due to extensive research that is still happening, that that's not the case. We now know that a lot of women that are coming to me now in their mid to late 40s or 50s that have no traditional risk factors, right? They don't have that, you know, the diabetes, the hypertension, the high cholesterol, the non-smokers. They don't even have the family history history, but they do have these adverse pregnancy outcomes that they never even thought could be leading to uh, what they're dealing with at this period of time. And what we're seeing a lot is early onset of hypertensive disease, whereas a woman without any disease, without any of these adverse pregnancy outcomes, would develop potentially hypertension based upon other risk factors uh, at the age of 55 or so. We now know that those women with underlying adverse pregnancy outcomes can develop hypertensive disease at least 10 years prior to general population, which is which is extensive, which is significant. Now, why does it happen? That's something that we still don't know. You know, we don't know whether or not it's something that happens within the actual placental vascular structure or whether or not these women are already at predisposed risk and the pregnancy some kind of unco uncovers it, right? Pregnancy, even though we want to make sure the fact that we look wonderfully glowing and glamorous during the time of our pregnancies, it's not really as glorious and glamorous as everybody likes to think. And it is a stress test on the body. So what happens in the time of the time that we get pregnant is that our heart that is usually pumping anywhere between five, four to five liters of blood per minute is now asked to pump anywhere between eight to 10 liters per minute, right? And there's so many hemodynamic, cardiac hemodynamic changes that occur that it really is equivalent of a stress test. So pregnancy is a stress test on the body. And the, way, the best way that I can explain to women what preeclampsia is, it's a failed stress test. Your body pretty much failed a stress test and is shown, beginning to show signs of it. And that is why you know, we've developed this cardioobstetric program where we no longer work in silos, where the obstetricians work in silos uh, and, cardio and our cardiologists work in silos. We formed a program where we now can have a seamless way of actually helping these women, uh, whether or not you know it's after their first pregnancy they develop these adverse pregnancy outcomes, or they want to get pregnant after they already had these adverse pregnancy outcomes, and how do we kind of deal with those components? What is the best way to get them through another pregnancy? Uh, that is the kind of things that we kind of all work out throughout the program. Thank you so much for um, shining light on the pregnancy uh, complications and how that translates into kind of future risk. I think that's so important and we don't talk about that nearly enough. Um, and I just want to ask, uh, there's some other uh, women specific risk factors too. I think that a lot of people are surprised to learn about. Um, if any of you want to highlight a couple of those. Well, I think rheumatologic disorders and inflammatory disorders right which inherently are more common in women, things like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, HIV, any inflammatory condition can be a risk factor for future heart disease because we've come to know that 
heart disease itself is an inflammatory condition, right? It, you know, it, there's, there's damage to the endothelium, which is the inner layer of the blood vessel. And that's often the way that heart disease begins. It's the very start of it. So if you have that type of disorder, you definitely have to count that as a risk factor and then, you know, get that checked out as well. I Absolutely. think you're referring to. So Tara, just to, to mention another thing is that I know that we don't talk about this also often enough, but from the cardio neurology standpoint, you know, those women that actually suffer from migraines, that could also be a sign that the fact that there's actually a structural issue as well with an opening of a PFO, a patent for amino valley, that actually women also, you know, they suffer from migraines and unless, God forbid, they actually have a stroke or some other complication of it, they won't ever even know about it. But that is also another component that we really rarely talk about when it comes to women and cardiac disease. Another risk factor that is also a newer area of cardiology, which is called cardio-oncology, um, is basically the overlap with cancers. So women, especially who have breast cancer and are receiving different chemotherapy regimens, as well as radiation to the chest, um, can have accelerated heart disease. So basically the chemotherapies can cause damage to your heart. It can cause you to have coronary artery disease, kind of those blockages we talked about, as well as reduced pump function, which is called heart failure. And then when you get radiation, that radiation is going to the breast tissue, but conveniently the heart is located in that same area. And so it can cause accelerated heart disease as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I think two of the other ones we sometimes mention, right, polycystic ovarian syndrome um, and early menopause. So and that brings me to kind of the next question, which is uh, how do we address cardiovascular health for women at different life stages, right? When should we start to talk to women about this? Is it in their 20s? Is there different things we should be focusing on in 20s? What about menopausal women um, who ask about things like HRT, right? So how do we address the spectrum uh, of cardiovascular health across a woman's life? So I'm going to make a blanket statement that based upon, you know, uh, one of our sort of predecessors in the women's heart health has taught, taught us is the fact that approach to women's health should no longer be a bikini approach, right? Uh, from the time that we are hit our reproductive years, right, in our early 20s to 20s, right, uh, to 30s, that we should not just be concentrating just on our reproductive organs on our, uh, you know, getting appropriately breast exams done and our GYN exams. I think it's imperative for us to understand what our baseline cardiac risks are. And, you know, women shouldn't wait or, you know, whereas before they thought there was a, a one-way street, only women with cardiac disease should get an evaluation by a cardiologist before getting pregnant. I think that women with any kind of risk factors, right, should actually really approach that. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I think that, you know, we want to address this at all stages of life. And we really want to start, we want to do primordial prevention. You know, <laughs> we want to go back and back and back. We don't want to, of course, we don't want to wait till someone has heart disease and has to have a bypass or a stent right? We don't want to do that. That's secondary prevention. And even primary prevention, we really want to go to where there's been no disease. So we have to educate our youngest people, again, male and female, but certainly our young women. We have to have them start early in uh, adopting routine exercise and good eating habits and not smoking and not vaping. And this, you know, that's been a, an issue with teenagers. Um, everyone should have their cholesterol done by their pediatrician and their pediatric guidelines on cholesterol. And so we can identify genetically inherited high cholesterol at an early age and treat that before it becomes a problem. But I really think we have to target our youngsters at school and educate them. I mean, I could tell you my kids who are now both vegan, plant-based eaters, um, they scold me all the time for the McDonald's that I that I gave them on Saturday nights when they were growing up and I wanted to go out with my friends. So I would bribe them at the time because they'd get the happy meal with the little toy inside. And now they're you know, in their 20s and they realize that that could have caused damage there um, because we know that the beginning of atherosclerosis, what Dr. Lee was telling us about, that starts as little fatty plaques in teenage years and then builds as we get older. So we really wanna, we wanna uh, that's how I would address it in the early years. 
I think my my kids are probably a little exhausted about having a mom who's a cardiologist <laughs> who teaches them how to read the nutrition labels on the side of their cereal boxes um, and make sure that they're getting their 60 minutes of exercise. But I agree. I think all of that, you know, the sooner we build in those healthy habits and the younger, then it just becomes routine. And it's not something that we have to change down the road. Um, you know, one of the other I think questions that women often ask is, well, I have a primary doctor. Do I need to see a cardiologist? And I think it's an interesting question. And, and I do find, you know, that a lot of times, even though women may have a primary doctor or an OBGYN, they're not really getting educated on risk and risk factors and screening. And so I always say, you know, it's never too early to see a cardiologist because I do think, you know, we talk about cardiovascular disease being the leading cause. having these conversations more uh, with women in their 20s and 30s and not in their 40s, 50s, 60s when an event has already happened. Um, and that that kind of leads me to another question, which is, we, I think you touched on it earlier, but just getting women to kind of prioritize themselves. How do you speak to your women about getting them to focus on themselves and put themselves at the top of their priority list? Because many times they're at the bottom. Yeah, so I recently found that I think that I've used it several times, this uh, funny slide where, you know, when you look at priorities for women, it's sort of, you know, kids and husband and pets and all of these, you know, everything that comes beforehand. And I kind of flip it upside down and I said, well, you realize the fact that if you don't put yourself on top, everything below you just crashes down. So, and similarly to what they always say sort of on the planes, right? You put an oxygen mask on yourself first, right? That's not a selfish thing. I think there's also sort of a very cultural component to it, right? Uh, where people feel the fact that a woman is supposed to be the giver, right? That she's the, the caretaker and, and that's what she's supposed to do then. And it is selfish on her part to actually do things for herself and take care of herself. Um, I think that people and women have to really quickly snap out of that component uh, because if they do not take care of themselves, if they do not do that, they will not be able to take care of their loved ones. So that's what I really do. I kind of, whenever I, I feel like I'm with a woman that has that kind of little bit of that, that guilt factor, that if I do this for myself, then I, you know, if I take 30 minutes a day to exercise for myself, then I will take those 30 minutes away from my children and I won't have the hot meal ready for my husband or anything of that nature. So I bring in that, I have it printed out in my office and I literally just show them what the cascade is and then I flip it upside down and I tell them that, you know, like if, you who should be on top, don't not take care of yourself. Everything is just going to crumble down. I agree with that uh, very strongly. And I also think we have to, we are doing so much and multitasking, but I think everybody has 20 or 30 minutes um, sort of wasted time or quiet time or something, which is important. But I mean, we have to look at our own habits. Are we scrolling, scrolling through Instagram? Are we looking at Facebook? You know, are we, what are we doing? Are we watching television? Can we take those 20 or 30 minutes and turn it into something something productive for us? Um, as you said, like doing that 20 minutes of exercise every day or doing five minutes of meditation or five minutes of inward looking or quiet time rather than scrolling so social media. I think we, we can all analyze our habits. Uh, all women, we're so busy, but I, I do believe that there are those 20, 30 minutes in our day that we can use towards ourselves. Yep. I do think to um, kind of reinforce all the things that have already been said, prioritizing yourself is really important, but also prioritizing taking care of yourself early. So I see most, I actually take care of patients in the hospital when they're hospitalized. And what happens is they haven't seen a doctor for 10 or 20 years. And then suddenly they're being diagnosed with high blood pressure and diabetes, and they have heart failure because their heart's not pumping well. And we're starting tens of meds and doing lots of tests. And they're very overwhelmed by the fact that they're gonna leave and have to see a doctor every other week for the next three months. But if you kind of invest the time earlier on, when we were talking about in our last question, the different stages of your life, if you're making sure, you know, if you have gestational diabetes, going and see a cardiologist then and figuring out what your risk factors are, and how to prevent future problems. And so if you're investing the time early, it really prevents things from getting worse later on the back end. And I think that's one important idea. 
And the other thing to piggyback off of what Dr. Katz said is, not only is there waste of time, but you can also build in things to take care of yourself into your daily routine. So what I often recommend to people is if you're going to the grocery store, you know, my dad's someone that will always go for the closest spot. Um, but you can also just decide instead of driving around for two minutes and wasting your time that way, you just take the spot at the end of the parking lot and then you spend those couple of minutes walking. And so you're automatically getting a little bit more exercise or similarly at work, instead of taking the elevator, taking the stairs, or, you know, it's okay to binge watch TV if that's what you need mentally, but maybe do it while you're on the treadmill or do it while you're sitting on the floor and stretching. Um, there's just little modifications you can make to your daily life that incorporates healthier activities, healthier habits, while still not taking up new or different time. So I think that one of the key factors that you also just mentioned was the the mental component of it, right? So the mental health component, which I think is also a huge, huge component, right? So as Dr. Katz mentioned, that cardiovascular disease, as we know now, is triggered a lot by in inflammation and inflammatory changes. Stress brings on a lot of those inflammatory changes as well. And being able to take care of ourselves in a healthy mental way is quite important, right? So I tell my patients, not only do they need to uh, exercise and do that 30 minute moderate exercise at least five days out of the week and, and eat healthy and clean and keep themselves well hydrated, that they have to give themselves a moment where they feel that they are getting that mental relief of one way or another. Now I can, you know, on the, I can personalize it in, in my own way, right? I have tried meditation in so many different ways uh, and yoga and everything else. And I just realized the fact that I am just not that person. And as Dr. Narula actually nicely mentioned that every single time she would call me, I'm always on the run. I'm running in and I'm running out and I'm just one of those people. But I did realize actually the fact that a lot of meditation has to deal with breathing, right? That deep, Breathing and my deep breathing, which comes part of my mental health and my form of meditation, comes from running. So when I run and I have those consecutive, regular, deep breathing components, that is what is my meditation. So I think that when people hear the word mental health and the need for meditating, they kind of get a little spooked because I know that I do, because I can't sit still for more than five minutes. You know, the fact that we've been doing this for almost 40 minutes and I've been sitting still is actually a huge <laughs> accomplishment for me. <laughs> but uh, having it said that, taking care of themselves mentally is quite important. Uh, trying to reduce stress in any possible way is important, but also finding it actually what works for you. There's no cookie cutter approach to anyone, to any woman, to any man. Um, so finding what actually works for you is key. And also along that lines, um, talking about mental health, there are actually studies on social connections and heart disease. And uh, those individuals who have strong social connections, there are studies on patients who, well, people who have partners versus those who are single, um, those with strong social connections, friend groups, et cetera, tend to fare better when they do develop heart disease and tend to develop less heart disease. So I think that's important too. We have friends, do things that are, do things that are, that interest you and make you happy. I'm really glad that you guys both brought up mental health because that's something that I talk about a lot with my patients. Um, and, you know, I find that when I walk in the exam room, I would say 40, 50% of the time when I ask, how are you? The first thing I hear about is I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm stressed. And a lot of our conversations focus on that. And when I ask people if they have a therapist or a psychiatrist, I get this look like, why are you asking me this? And then when I explain that, yes, your mental health is tied into your cardiovascular health, um, I think people are very surprised to hear that. But um, I think we need to continue to talk about it and to get help for it. Um, and somehow it's interesting what, what does seem to sort of push people in that direction is recognizing that actually it might be tied to their physical health. I mean, I wish more people would get help for their mental health issues without that knowledge, but I do think when they 
feel that it might impact their heart health, then it's almost like an aha moment. Okay, maybe I can do something or I should do something about this. But um, I'm really glad that you that you brought that up. Um, and I think, Dr. Lee, your point about, you know, the little, and, and every, I think all of you actually mentioned the little changes that we can make in our daily routines. You know, we talk about prevention and cardiovascular disease and, and how 80% of heart disease is preventable. And <clears throat> by lifestyle choices. And those lifestyle choices are hard. I think a lot of people think that, you know, it's easy, but no, I mean, even for all of us, you know, every time you sit down to make a choice about what you're going to eat, you have to think, you have to like have willpower when you decide to get up and go for a run like you do, Dr. Graber. I mean, nobody wants to do that. So these are choices, but they are, they do require thought and effort and, and you really have to invest um, in making those little changes, but those little changes go a long, long way. Um, so I want to ask a little bit about, uh, like multitasking and some of these choices. I think a lot, one of the questions that comes up a lot, we talked about exercise and mental health is diet. A lot of people want to know, especially women, what is a heart healthy diet? Um, so how do you answer that question, uh, when someone asks you how they should be eating for their health? So I think I'm a cardiologist guilty of um, liking all the things I'm not supposed to like. <laughs> so, you know, I like the unhealthy foods. I don't love exercise. And I think it makes me very empathetic with my patients. Um, and so when I'm counseling people on diet, I often tell them, you know, I don't want you to become a vegetarian tomorrow because that's just not sustainable. You can't make these huge, big changes in your life that you're not going to be able to maintain. And so it's all about making slight adjustments and just smarter choices. So example, and the other thing I also say is everyone's allowed a slice of birthday cake on their birthday. That's always allowed. Um, that is not calories. Birthday cakes, the, by definition, never have any calories in them. <laughs> um, and so what I say is, you know, if you're given the option between red meat and pork or chicken and fish, you know, opt for the chicken and fish. If you are hungry, maybe put more vegetables on your plate than another serving of the pasta. Um, and it's just a general kind of frame of mind that you wanna be eating more whole grains, legumes, vegetable, fruits, reducing your intake of red meats and pork specifically, um, and just trying to make these healthier choices. And it's not something that you're gonna excel at instantly. And it's something that's gonna take a really long time but the idea is just knowing what's a healthy option and what's an unhealthy option and trying to move in the healthy direction as often as possible. And obviously, you know, little cheat days, little treats are allowed, but just trying to cut back on them. Uh, and the other thing that kind of goes with that, that I often tell patients is, you know, if you are overweight or obese and need to lose weight, a healthy amount of weight loss is really one pound in a week. And so all of these kind of fad diets and crash courses and juicing, um, while that might translate to fast weight loss, it's usually not weight loss that people keep up and it's really not healthy. And so it's more just about making small changes. And that's where personally, I've been able to make adjustments to my life because as I said, I like all the bad things. And so I've just been having to focus on, you know, maybe get a little bit more exercise today, maybe have, you know, don't eat a burger, instead find something healthy. And it's just making those small choices. And over time, it's made a huge difference in my life. So yeah. I think that one of the things that I recently, I was uh, grocery shopping and there was a, a monstrous uh, shelf of magazines there. And there was a total, I counted, there was 14 magazines. And out of 14 magazines, 12 magazines had uh, different types of diets recommendation, right? And it's just, I looked at it and I'm like, I have no idea how any person could ever come up with a per perfect diet plan when there's just literally this 12 magazine standing in front of me. So what I always tell my patients is the exact same thing that you said, the fact that there is no such thing as a magic diet. I don't believe in fat diets. I don't believe in these diets, you know, losing 10 pounds in 10 seconds kind of a thing, right? Um, the one advice that I tell my patients all the time is that even if they can get rid of all of their sugary drinks, uh, juices, sodas, and just supplement that with water, that's going to be a monstrous change for them to begin with. And then when they really, 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 really feel hungry, before they even start eating, to drink at least a, a couple 
cup or two of water to kind of fill us up. Because sometimes when we think the fact that we're hungry, we're more thirsty than hungry, but, you know, we kind of start eating, you know, but having taken in a glass or two of, of water before a massive meal is actually could actually help you not overeat. I always tell my patients to actually chew slowly and sometimes count, but that gets really silly to start counting when you're chewing, but just, you know, not to kind of uh, grab anything and everything on your plate and eat it as quickly as possible. And before your brain can actually realize the fact that you are eating and you're now full, you're still eating. Um, so that's one of the things, but I always sort of go back to what we have the most evidence-based knowledge upon, and that is sort of our DASH diet, our vegan diet, and our Mediterranean diets, right? And, but the, those three, what they have most in common with is the fact that it is, there's lots of fruit in there, there's lots of vegetables in there, there's lots of nuts, there's healthy oils, uh, and, and healthy legumes, right? So we, we know all of that. We know that that is really the base of a healthy diet. And whatever we add on top of it, whether or not it's chicken or, or the fish, uh, or if it, even if it's red meat once in a while, then that's fine. But to completely get rid of everything and to say, I will never touch another piece of bread ever in my life, it'll never happen. It could last for a week or two, three at most, and then people will just binge. And then you do exactly what you mentioned, where you go through these crash diets and you do this yo-yo thing up and down, up and down, which is actually extremely detrimental to your uh, health overall. And when you mention never have another piece of bread, I agree with you, we all need bread, but we can make small changes, as you said. I mean, I always ask my patients if possible, if you, you like pasta and bread and potatoes, just change it to whole grain. You know, mm -hmm. if you get a multigrain bread instead, uh, get a whole wheat pasta or a cauliflower pasta. They make so many types of pastas now that are not really pasta and they're very, very good. Um, so we can make those little changes too. Get a sweet potato instead of a white potato and, um, and we can do that. And, and I think you also touched on uh, the fact that this, you know, we're always in such a rush that we have to eat and grab as we go. Whereas meals are su supposed to be, you know, a joyful experience. A meal is meant to be a joyful experience, often to share with someone else, to share with your family, most usually. And, and we should really enjoy that experience. And as you said, let's take it easy, eat a little slower, really enjoy what we're having. And so we won't overeat. And I think also when it comes to healthy eating, we have to have adequate preparation. I know in my life and probably all of yours too, we are always running all over and just grabbing as we go. So oftentimes it's helpful to have one day of the week what maybe it's not as busy as the others, perhaps a Sunday where you can prepare some things that you can have in little containers for the rest of the week. So if for instance, you're that person who likes to have ice cream at 8 p.m., and you know, a lot of people do, a lot of us do. If you have a little container full of fresh berries and maybe some non-dairy whipped topping or some granola on it in a container, you'll go to that. And along those lines also, I find it helpful to just do a clean of the cabinets. You know, on a day or a weekend where there's, it's not so busy, just throw out all the bad stuff. If it's not in the house, we're less likely to go into the car and out to the store to buy it. And then let's stock our cabinets with really healthy, unprocessed foods. Great, thank you so much. Um, I know we have about 10 minutes left, so this would be a great time if anybody who is part of our webinar wants to ask some questions in the chat box, um, we could try to have our guest panelists answer. So feel free to type away. Um, in the meantime, if anybody, well, anybody is asking their question, um, I just want to touch a little bit on microvascular disease or the type of specific disease that many women get. Uh, can you explain what that is and how the blockages or, or cardiovascular disease, coronary disease may look different in a, women, in a woman than in a man? Yeah, I could take that. You know, um, so the most usual uh, way a person will develop heart disease is the characteristic blockage plaque, as we said, the cholesterol calcified plaque that goes inside the artery. But that's not always the case. And sometimes there's a different presentation of heart artery disease. And it is more common that a woman will have a different presentation. And that there, there are many different types of 
uh, non-blockage type heart artery disease um, manifestations. So there are about six or seven different types. One of the types is spasm, where the artery walls just sort of close in on each other, like a spasm like you would have in any other muscle. But there's also, like you said, coronary microvascular disease, where just the health of the artery, that the artery doesn't respond normally. It doesn't dilate normally as it should. Instead, it constricts. It gets smaller to certain stresses. That's another way. And then there's also another type of disease that women get more frequently is that instead of the cholesterol and plaque going, going inwards, like inside the tube, it sort of grows outside into the wall of the artery. And when it goes outward, we don't see it. If you do an angiogram dye test and you look inside, you may see good blood flow because the majority of that plaque and cholesterol is growing in the wall and outside. And you need special techniques to look at that. Like we have OCT and, and we have IVIS. So we have special techni techniques that can look in at the artery. But those are uh, a few of the different types. Then of course there's SCAD, right? We have spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Women get more frequently than men, although that's pretty rare too, but that's where the artery actually gets a tear in it, a dissection. And another type that's a little bit different is Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy, a whole nother talk on itself, but, um, but that's also related to this microvascular disease. You don't really have to have a cholesterol blockage for the heart muscle to be damaged, usually at a time of stress. Um, one of the questions that comes up a lot uh, is, do I need a stress test every single year? Um, so Dr. Lee, do, do women need a stress test every single year? So I certainly don't think that's the case. Um, I do think that there is a wide variety of tests we can do. We talked about the coronary artery calcium score. There's also a great test, um, a coronary CT, basically, or a CCTA. We like to use lots of acronyms in medicine. Uh, but basically this is where we inject some contrast and we do a scan and we can actually look at the blood flow inside your arteries. And so your artery should kind of be like a straw, right? So it should be kind of parallel, nice walls that are smooth and straight and they taper off over time. And if you have plaques, you'll get little bumpy walls that kind of come in and have little tight blockages. And so if we do a CCTA, we can actually just see what your vessels look like. And so if you're someone who's having symptoms, I think depending on your symptoms and your risk factors, it's reasonable to get a CCTA, a stress test, or maybe even an invasive test. Um, but if you're having the same stable symptoms that we've already kind of utilized a lot of our tools, we should be thinking about elsewhere. You can have chest pain if you have reflux, you can have chest pain with anxiety. And it's not meant to be dismissive, but I just think it's sometimes harmful when we have patients coming in and getting repeat testing over and over and over again, because the radiation can affect you. The dyes can affect your kidney. It's dangerous for us to be poking into your vessels all the time. And so I think it's really depends on the individual, their risk factors, their symptoms, and also the testing that's been done in the past, kind of to tie together all the things we've said, you know your body best, you should be a really good advocate. You should make sure your doctor is listening to you and really pursuing all the testing. But if we've kind of made sure you don't have a treatable cause and a treatable cardiac disease, then maybe we need to start thinking about other causes, other organ systems, other specialties, because the real issue is you don't feel well. And we need to get to the bottom of why you don't feel well. I think we have two questions, which is probably going to take us through the end. So I'm going to ask both of them um, from our uh, audience here. And if you guys can answer, that'll probably take us to seven. But the first question is, does autoimmune thyroid disease like Hashimoto's or Graves raise your risk of heart disease? And then the second question is, does mitral valve prolapse raise your risk of heart disease? So I, I can take either one, but just to start off with the first one. So Hashimoto, so thyroid disease, so thyroid gland is very closely related to cardiac disease, right? And if there's any sort of abnormality within thyroid, whether or not it's hypothyroid or hyper, like with Graves, right? It can definitely affect the heart significantly. Autoimmune disorders, as was previously mentioned by Dr. Katz, are really inflammatory states, right? And that inflammation definitely disrupts that endothelial level, that inner layer of the vessels. But when it comes to the thyroid, 
thyroid especially, right? It can cause a multitude of things, everything from uh, arrhythmias, uh, palpitations, um, actually weakening in the heart muscles, such as cardiomyopathies, uh, and actually develop premature coronary disease because of that inflammatory status. So yes, the autoimmune part of the thyroid disease can definitely affect it, but the thyroid disease in itself, because as to what the thyroid hormones can do, can actually affect the heart muscle significantly. Anyone want to address the mitral valve prolapse question? I was going to add a little bit to the thyroid. Um, so I take care of lots of patients in the hospital and a very common problem that patients come in with is a fast heart rate and palpitations. And it's an abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. And it's, I'm sure you've seen commercials. There's like tons and tons of commercials about AFib. And thyroid is something that I always check in these patients because if you have elevated thyroid hormones, it can actually drive you to have atrial fibrillation. And so when we talk about heart disease, we've spoke spoken a lot about coronary artery disease, meaning the plaques and the blockages, but heart conditions can include abnormal heart rhythms. It can include valve disorders like mitral valve prolapse. It can include heart failure where your heart's too stiff and can't accept the blood or heart failure where your heart's too weak and can't pump the blood. It can be disease in your arteries and veins in your whole body. And so when we talk about cardiovascular disease, it's very broad. And so having something like an elevated thyroid can cause you to have an abnormal heart rhythm or having a low thyroid level can cause a buildup of fluid around your heart. And so there's many ways in which your different organs can affect your heart, not just the plaques, but a broad range of heart dis uh, diagnoses. So uh, the mitral valve prolapse question, I think, is a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, we know mitral valve prolapse, number one, is not quite as common as we used to think it was. You know, when I first started in practice, basically everybody had mitral valve prolapse, and it's because mitral valve is human tissue. And just like human tissue, you know, it's somewhat flexible. And um, so we would see the mitral valve just going, you know, backwards into the top chamber a little bit, and we'd say that's prolapse. And I find many, many of my patients are surprised when we do an echo now, we say, you don't have it. And they say, well, what happened? Did it disappear? No, it never disappeared. It just was never there because we changed our standards. We've learned that the mitral valve is allowed to have a little laxity to it. And we actually have a measurement. It has to be two millimeters in the opposite direction to actually cause prolapse. Now, having said that, the major problem that, that we find with mitral valve prolapse would be a valve disease, like a leakage backwards through that mitral valve, something called mitral insufficiency or mitral regurgitation. And that's something that can progress over time, although having a mild case, a mild amount of mitral regurgitation, I think is almost normal. I call it physiologic. I mean, you know, most people do have a little bit of mitral insufficiency. But as far as whether or not mitral valve prolapse itself is a risk factor for heart artery disease. I don't know of the correspondence there, of the correlation. I'll ask the other cardiologists. I think that the only thing that I can really think about is Dean, exactly what you said. I think that it was until the time that we actually had definition of how much they have to be actually prolapsed into the upper chamber that we actually diagnose them. I think that at times mitral valve prolapse uh, is at times associated with some degree of uh, arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia. Uh, but again, I think that's more in relation to how much of that regurgitation, that flow bath actually that occurs, and there's a stretch of a sort of remodeling of the actual, um, of the upper chambers. So I think that, again, mitral valve prolapse is significantly over uh, diagnosed in the past. I think now we have very clear sort of echocardiographic guidelines as to how to diagnose mitral valve prolapse. And a lot of the symptoms of cardiac disease or worsening cardiovascular disease has to do with the associated leak through that valve because of the prolapse, if it does happen. Thank you all so much. I think it's seven o'clock on the dot, and this was such a, a wonderful conversation. Um, I loved being joined by such incredible cardiologists. Um, so proud of our program. So thank you to everyone for listening in. Hopefully you learned something important uh, that you will take back to your life and your family's life. And thank you all, Dr. Katz, Dr. Graver, Dr. Lee, for, for joining us tonight uh, and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so Sarah. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you for having us. Take care. Bye.